go back to generating electricity with a windmill, which is mm. the difference between a wind turbine and a mill. But if you go back into the 80s, when the very first up tower power generation began, you know, probably the late 70s into the early 80s, they're relatively small units, right? They're mm. no more than 100, 200 kilowatts, which is 0.2 of a megawatt. Open towers, some of them had three blades, four blades, two blades. I've even seen photographs of things with five or six blades here in the U.S. And it, it was just this desire to generate electricity. The Europeans were much better at it than the U.S. folks. But even then, building larger and larger machines didn't come along until the, the late 80s, early 90s. Yeah, right. And back in the early days, people would just grab whatever industrial gearbox was available, doing whatever kind of work. If you say had a uh, a steel mill and you had a, a 0.2 megawatt gearbox that was a feeder for smelting machines. It, instead of pushing electricity into that gearbox from an electric motor, why don't we just put, put it up tower and spin it backwards and drive a generator on the backside? So that was the, the quick and dirty engineering logic there. So at the time, <clears throat> in, industrial gearing was just what you had said a little bit earlier that the lubrication of the industrial gearing was just cut back industrial automotive style lubricants. And even today, when you look at automatic transmissions and uh, manual gearbox transmission oils that are used in, in today's application, there's still a hangover. Really hasn't been questioned the way industrial lubricant evolution has really taken everything down to the basic molecule. As an industrial lube guy for over 20 years and somebody who comes from you know, a family of motorheads, I can tell you that the most powerful automotive conveyance you have today is really quite small and wimpy compared to large industrial gearing. You're dealing <laughs> with, you're dealing with several orders of magnitude of power going through an industrial gearbox relative to say a wide open throttle, uh, nitro burning funny car, or even large industrial trucks that cruise the highways. So that those particular gearbox those were just industrial gearboxes. They put them up tower and they would run for six, eight, 10, 12 months, and they would all fail. Broken teeth, bearings that would wipe out. You'd have uh, shafts that would snap. And it didn't really take more than seven to 10 years into the early 90s or, or so, or through the 80s into the early 90s, where people realized, oh, wait a minute, if we really want some reliable power generation, you have to increase the quality, not to the degree of, say, aircraft machining quality and whatnot, but we have to get a little bit better at devising machines that are tighter, that have tighter tolerances, that are capable of more sustained power throughput from wind events to generate uh, electricity. And that's really the beginning of mechanical reliability played into the evolution of the lubricants that went into those machines in the, through the 90s. And that was really where the genesis of Mobile Gear SHC XMP came in because there were a lot of attempts to use metal free type formulations and then metal type heavily laden formulations that had lots of zinc, lots of calcium. And there really wasn't a consensus. There were two sort of philosophies, metal free and, and heavy metals, heavy concentrations of metals. It really wasn't a consensus as to what, how everything would shake out, but it was apparent that once you got into machines that were beyond a quarter of a megawatt, getting up into the half a megawatt, approaching 1.0 megawatts, those machines got more and more sophisticated, more and more loaded. And that's where the micro failures started to accumulate. 